million times. So, um, I'm not sure if you all have been following the infrastructure talks, but we got a little bit of a wrench thrown into everyone's plans. So just to give everyone background, if you haven't been following this, and I don't blame anyone who hasn't been following the situation because it changes so so quickly. But basically, the plan to get progressives to go along, progressive in, progressives in Congress, to go along with the infrastructure deal was to give them a reconciliation package. Because basically... Congressional progressives were left out of the talks for the infrastructure because all the conservatives got what they want. So um, everyone in Congress, Joe Biden, they all agreed if we pass this infrastructure bill that the conservatives in Congress and both parties want, then um, we'll pass a reconciliation bill at the same time. Well, now all of a sudden they reached an agreement on the infrastructure bill. And Kirsten Sinema is saying, actually, I don't support the reconciliation bill. So immediately betraying the entire goal of this compromise, trying to ice out progressives. And I'll, I'll get your thoughts on this, but I just want to read a little bit from this story. I mean, we knew this was coming. Joe Manchin was already signaling that he wants to water down the reconciliation proposal, which would contain um, – possibly a minimum wage increase, but unlikely. But more specifically, what was being fought for with progressives in Congress, primar primarily Bernie Sanders, is lowering the Medicare eligibility age from 65 to 60 and expanding coverage so it includes dental, hearing, and vision, which would be incredible. I mean, it's not Medicare for all, but it, it is moving us in that direction by expanding Medicare, and that's exactly what we want to do. Uh, but now the conservatives in Congress... Kirsten Cinema is uh, shitting on it. So this is from Raw Story, and it reads: Arizona Democratic Senator Kirsten Cinema was riding high on Wednesday as a group of Republicans announced their support for a bipartisan infrastructure uh, deal by uh, through by the afternoon. Though by the afternoon, it still wasn't clear if it had enough votes to pass. Just as momentum was building for that legislation, though. Cinema deflated hopes for Democrats' follow-up act, a $3.5 billion budget reconciliation bill. And the reason why this is important is because this just needs 50 plus one votes to pass. It doesn't need the 60-vote majority required for other pieces of legislation. So that's why they're trying to get this all done at the same time. So the budget bill only requires 50 votes to pass. Oh, I shouldn't have explained all that. Avoiding the 60-vote threshold that the Senate typically requires to enact law, that means Democrats don't need any Republican votes to pass a budget bill. But with only 50 Democratic lawmakers in the Senate, the party needs every member on board if it's going to shove its spending priorities through the budget process as long as the plan, or as, as long been the plan. In a Wednesday statement, uh, to the Arizona Republic, though, Cinema announced she doesn't want to spend $3.5 trillion on the bill. I have also made clear that while I will support beginning this process, I do not support a bill that costs $3.5 trillion, and in the coming months, I will work in good faith to develop this legislation with my colleagues and the administration to strengthen Arizona's economy and help Arizona's everyday families get ahead. Yeah, right. So basically what's happening is she got everything that she wanted, her and her, you know, right wing ghouls, they got everything that they wanted in the infrastructure proposal. And now they're trying to control the reconciliation bill, which is where progressives are supposed to get some concessions. Um, now, I genuinely hope that progressive members of Congress fight. I'm, I'm comfortable with Bernie Sanders as the uh, budget reconciliation chair. But at the same time, we knew this was happening, but it's still really frustrating. Um, thoughts from the panel here. And people thought that AOC was not being, you know, uh, was changing too much going to Capitol Hill. Look at what Senator Sinema's become. I mean, she was a Green Party member and now she's as right wing as uh, it gets. Isn't that great? She was a member of Code Pink. Code Pink. And now she is in line with Republicans um, well, the majority I think of the time. Bought. She's just been bought. I Like, that's right. the thing. She obviously doesn't have any of those convictions. None of them were ever real, if you can just be so easily swayed. And I think that it's funny the way she says, we, I was just saying that to Peter, it's funny the way she says, well, I, I don't want to spend that, as if it's coming out of her pocketbook. Like, if you right. read the way, that she's, the way that she's talking, it's like your kid's seeking an allowance raise and you're just not worth it. Mm. Like, she's not, you know... Like whatever her stuff is, but um, it's modern, interesting. Modern Clearly, it's her donors. Yeah. Well, it's whoever she works for doesn't want to do that because they just don't. Doesn't serve them. That's why. Because it obviously isn't her. She doesn't but have what, any. Belief. What's her? What's her deal? Like, why is she so eccentric? Corporate like, special yeah, interest She's money. just bought. Corporate She's a corporate whore. Money. So but, it's but her there's one thing like voting, but the way she does it is like, mm. you know, obviously the viral one when she like 
literally walks over like it's no big deal and then does the little curtsy and does the thumbs down. Well, I think yeah. that's just seeking that's just seeking clicks and seeking yeah. drama and just being the center of attention and thinking yeah. you're all that. And you know, she's another one of those women that I just think never properly had their ass kicked as a kid because they didn't grow up in my seventies <laughs> in South Florida or we would have dealt with this her <laughs> Marjorie Taylor Green and it's like there's a slew of them that just really never got their ass kicked sufficiently. It's it's um, funny you say that because I, I just got up a, a Jacobin article about it and apparently she grew up in like quite bad poverty and stuff like no running water or electricity and it's just like she, talking talking about like how anti capitalist she was as well and like working for Na Ralph Nader's like two thousand campaign and stuff it's actually insane it's and she was about my age when she did this so I really hope you know <laughs> nothing bad happens to me when I get to, to I'm to getting her age. further left <laughs> and I just turned fifty so I'm, I'm moving <laughs> to the left. I don't know if that helps you. That that's yeah. that's encouraging to see. No, you know, Kirsten Cinema was actually um she was homeless at a time. So there's this massive cliff that we're about to go off of with the moratorium on evictions expiring. Yeah. And you'd think there would be at least some level of urgency, even for her own career, because she has constituents who are gonna be affected by this too. But there's just there's there's no concern whatsoever. And now what I think is kind of happening is what ever like prospect there was that she'd be reasonable is gone because she now she knows that even her own constituents uh 66 percent of arizona voters would support somebody else over her in a primary so she's thinking okay if i'm gonna survive this now i really have to go to bat for my donors because i'm not gonna get money at all through you know uh constituents so i'm gonna need super PACs to fund my campaign when I, you know i'm up for re-election and so maybe that's part of it also i i genuinely and this is a little bit like reductionist but i feel like it, she enjoys being evil as many members of congress do like when i look at people like her and joe Manchin, i think these people are are genuinely like sociopathic to to not care during a pandemic about so many people suffering um we're on the brink of a major housing crisis you know the uh delta variant is ravaging communities already people are going to need support and now when the reconciliation bill couldn't make a difference expand health care they're they're fighting against it and it you know as if it wasn't bad enough that there were members of congress fighting this there is an all-out war against bernie sanders just as his provision meager provision to expand medicare coverage the americans for prosperity the coke funded network is fighting against him doing that saying that it's like a government takeover of health care i've got news for republicans medicare is something that uh, the country overwhelmingly supports, and it was always controlled by the government. It's not like Medicare was this private company that was all of a sudden nationalized. It's always been a national program, so there's no there's no takeover. But I mean, they throw out these buzzwords, uh, throw everything at the wall in hopes that something will stick, and it's 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 really infuriating to me. Like it, when I see this stuff, it really is. Um, it's frustrating. I, I don't want to. I don't want to. I'll let other people jump in if you if you wanted to add to this before we move on. Just well, again, it's, it's all me. corporate special interest money. That is what defines our politics uh, a lot. Most of politics, in my opinion, is not complicated. It's just not. Uh, people are complicated, for sure. Uh, but the overarching issues that we face really comes down to, you know, uh, we were just talking about this uh, earlier. Uh, there are 100 senators on Capitol Hill, and only two of them do not have lobbyists knocking down their door, Rand Paul and Bernie Sanders. And that's it. Mm. Everybody else deals with this every day, hundreds of millions of dollars spent. And again, it's a great investment because what they spend <laughs> and what they get out of it always works. Oh, it's a very cheap buy. And, and in the case person. of, you know, why we need to change the infrastructure and for anybody who's near Nevada, I would just look at their model and what they did to take over the state party, because that's really what you need to do. So much of this problem is systemic and it becomes this, uh, what, what, what's the, the rotating villain? All right, so today mm. it's Kristen Cinema. Tomorrow it's well, Joe. It's Manchin. political theater. The next day it's right. Diane Feinstein, and then soon enough you'll you know you'll boomerang it to you know whoever. It, it could be uh, Kristen Gillibrand. You know, so it's uh, th this is how it works. And right now, you know, she's taking on the heat because the truth is they don't want to give us anything. They want us to suffer because they like this idea of living high on the hog and looking down at the peasants, saying, "Hey, you know, it's." Uh, that's why somebody like cinema is a great example of that. Somebody who did come from very humble beginnings and really went through a lot and then was ultimately able to climb the ladder, so to speak. But 
man, as soon as she got to the Senate, she turned fast. And that it didn't even there, there was no like grace period. It was just like full on, you know, whatever the corporate donors want, I'm doing it. And that's why we really need to hammer home this message of corporate special interest money. That is what is defining us. And especially the race with Nina Turner and her opponent, who I do mm. not care. Name, you know, that's just a prime example of that. Nina is as grassroots funded as it gets. And her opponent is as corporate funded as it gets. It couldn't be more distinct in terms of the two candidates you're getting. And regardless of whether you think Nina's going to fight the way you want her to fight, if she were to get there, she will damn sure fight a hell of a lot better than that other person if she were to get there, who will just be every other corporate Democrat that is on Capitol Hill. Yeah, yeah, great points. And I, I, I agree with the political theater point that it is always like there's some scapegoat there. And Kirsten Sinema effectively is a scapegoat, a scapegoat. I mean, at the end of the day, Biden has the bully pulpit. If he really wanted to, he could exert a tremendous <laughs> amount of pressure. He could offer, you know, even pork barrel benefits if he's really desperate to try to get some, you know, legislative concessions. But, you know, if nothing gets accomplished, then it's like, well, my donors are happy. And at least the American people think that we tried. I just want to know, I'm curious, what would President Donald Trump think about Kirsten Sinema um, oh, no. as a Democrat? Like, you I wonder to ask this. What would President Trump think? Well, here's what I have to say about Kirsten Cinematic. She's a lovely lady. She's a beautiful lady. Have you seen her? She's really incredible, really tremendous. And the great thing is that she told me in private that she'd vote for me if I ran in 2024. Isn't that incredible? That's a really great, that's great inside I'm sure information. She did. Really great inside information. And that's why I'm totally considering running again. Because America, so I, I, Mike, I have the slogan. I've got the slogan. Tell me what you think. It's really great. It's really incredible. Let's Make hear it. Let's hear it. America great again, again. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Put it on a t-shirt. Put it on everything with Trump. Trump steak, Trump housing, Trump everything. It's really MAGA. Great. It's really great. Uh. <laughs> 